So thank you, dear friends, for coming to the Prague Writers' Festival. It's the 23rd year. The Carnation Revolution, the Red Carnations, 1974 in Lisbon, sort of theme. We're presenting two distinguished writers, two really great novelists. The first part of the evening will be, we will present Yashmina Kadra from Algeria. He will speak with Joseph Broch. And then Mikhail Pavlata will read from his novel, The Swallows of Kabul. After Yasmina Kadra, we have Sonala Ibrahim from Egypt. I will speak with him, and he will read in Arabic from the committee, which was published here. And equally, that will be read in English, Czech, and in French over the headphones. So enjoy yourselves. Parce qu'à aucun moment, je n'ai renoncé à cela. C'est un devoir pour moi de me battre pour mon talent. Que l'on soit à l'écoute ou pas, c'est le cadet de mes soucis. Je crois dans cette vocation, je l'investis et je la poursuis de toutes mes forces et de toutes mes convictions. Il faut que le jeune talent algérien le sache. C'est-à-dire qu'il ne faut pas qu'il attende du pays que l'on vienne euh, dérouler devant lui le tapis rouge. Ça, il peut toujours attendre. Je le trouve face à une réalité qui nous dépasse et d'un seul coup, on se, rétrac, on se casse derrière des a priori. Dès l'aéroport, je raccroche tous mes trophées tout... <rire> et j'ai hâte de, de retrouver mes amis. Après, vous savez, ces gamins-là, ils sont endoctrinés. Oui. Donc ils pensent aller sauver le monde alors qu'ils ne servent que des intérêts de la finance internationale. Et puis, dans ce, ils, ils pensent... Là, C'est <laughs> Merci. Dámy a pánové, dobrý večer. Ladies and gentlemen. 
J'ai l'honneur de vous. I have the honor to introduce to you a person who is an impersonation of a country about which I dreamt when I studied in Paris. We can also talk about my friends because often I went to the country uh, and I met a lot of uh, Algerians students and they actually finally corrected the image of France which I had. I will be introducing a writer who has come to join us. Is, is it the first time in the Czech Republic? Yes, I'm here for the first time. I do hope that I'll be able to come back. It depends on the Czechs whether they like me or not. Of course it is very nice to meet someone you, uh, who it has been translated here. Uh, two books have been translated. The first is called The Swallows of Kabul. And the second book, which is called The Attack, has been translated into Czech and it's been translated as a black widow. It's a trilogy where you look back on the situation in Baghdad, and your books have been translated into 42 languages and published in many countries, and you've almost become the Nobel Prize winner. And the question that I would like to start with concerns um, the beginning, that is, the first idea of an army officer who has become a writer. That's indeed surprising. And if uh, I, you look back on the years in the uh, Czech uh, uh, army and Czech army school, that's probably something that uh, makes it difficult for me to think about an army situation and writing. You come from the west of Sahara. Sahara. Well, thank you for that question. For me, it's also absurd to think that you can categorize people, like some kind of people are made for writing and another kind of people are made for military service. That's not the case. Um, there is a generosity in every uh, profession that you do in your life. Uh, one person may become a great writer, another person may become a great leader or um, army officer or, or even the pope. Because that's a vocation. We have a heart, we have a spirit um, or soul which brings us somewhere and um, here in Czechoslovakia. Well, Czechoslovakia is a country where they've translated my books. Well, that's why you've come here. All people in the world says, uh, say to me that uh, here in Czech Republic, there's been a low number of people, a low number of books translated, and still they translated the trilogy. Perhaps uh, the Czechs will discover my works later on. And in order to answer your question, I was born to write. And indeed, uh, already in the uterus of my mother, I was being made to write. I spent a lot of time in Algiers, in the Sahara Desert. And um, if I look back on the history, I remember the time of six uh, hundred years, and uh, I also remember uh, the time of uh, uh, the first history where we. Uh, it is very difficult to remember Muhammad Musul, and he was the first of a pluralist school in all the Africa because uh, in the 15th century he established a first 
interdisciplinary school where not only theology was taught, but also geography, mathematics, and also the first contingent, which was made by Muhammad Musul, was the Confrerie Punta, which was one of the most important brotherhoods which has lived until this day. So you can see that in history, my predecessors kept choosing the same mission, that is, become a writer, be involved in literature. And in my family, those who excelled, you know, there were several people who excelled in the 17th century poetry. There was a person who was the key advisor of our King Meknes. And in the 18th century, another Musul, a member of our family who traveled a lot and who traveled the whole country and died close to Clemson, which is an Algerian region. And that person also taught. And on his tombstone, um, it is mentioned that he was a man of literature. And the last in the line was my person. When he was born, he hated poets. And I think he was right, because he said that the best poetry in the world is a woman. And that's why he spent time with women rather than books. And I was the oldest son. <laughs> and as such, I suffered because uh, that was considered a deviation. I wanted to spend my time on poetry, but it was not sufficient for him. Two years after Algeria gone, got independence in 1964, he took me away from my mother and put me in a military school. So I started attending military school. And in our system, it is important to respect the parents. So I could not defy my father on that. But the first text, that was something I wrote when I was 11 years old. Little Muhammad, that was a bit of plagiarism, um, a story about a small child. And then I wrote another piece, and that was actually published. And I continued on that road. And I wouldn't say that this is my second profession, second job. I think I was a good soldier while I was working as a soldier. I was a good soldier. I attained high levels of qualification, showed my qualities, but at the same time, I never forgot that I'm also a writer. And I think that a lot of people in France find that a bit confusing. They always say, oh, this is the ex-soldier, but that's not the case. And that's why you were writing after the war. No, I was serving my country with a lot of passion. I never forgot that a lot of Algerians were killed for us, for our liberty, for our freedom. And therefore, we got to think about that with generosity, because that was a great gift to us. And therefore, I'm Bedouin. I have this traveling mentality. And for me, uh, if there is no right, no law, you cannot live as a person. One day, you said that you wanted to become a poet, but you are seen also uh, as a poet who did not succeed to become a poet. I, uh, for me, the Arabic poets are the great poets, even though in the West people don't know them. Uh, and of course, I read poetry from Russia, American poetry. I've read also German and Austrian poetry. But the greatest poets of all humanity are 
Arab, Arabic poets. It was always my dream to become like Al Mutanabi. Um, that is, that was the excellence, the highest note of universal poetry. But at a certain moment, I realized I could never uh, match that great poet. In your writings, one feels something that reminds me of a poetic rhythm, um, a special poetic rhythm on the one hand, and one also feels lots of facts that you learn, and the facts also reminded me of certain issues like Albert Camus, because uh, you also remind us uh, of Albert Camus in the way you describe the countryside, etc. No, it's not by writing. I believe that there is a kind of um, madness uh, to love uh, Algeria as if this were a mythic and fantastic and which it is, and you're crazy because you're in love, and uh, it's a magic country which has given us Saint Augustine, the greatest Christian writer, it has given us Albert Camus, a great writer, uh, and indeed a lot of uh, people uh, like uh, Maupassant uh, were not so fortunate, so to speak. However, in our country, there is something magic about our country. I'll give you an example. When I went to Tokyo, I gave a lecture there. And after that lecture, there were people coming. There was one Japanese man who got up and stood and didn't want to ask me a question. He was all trembling and he said to me, I've got to go and see Algiers. I've never seen that country, I've never been to that country, but your words appealed to me so much. But I don't write like other coming. But there is something Algerian in me, something that uh, lets the Algerian nature enter our texts. Of course, everyone can have a different interpretation of this. Everyone sees different influences. You were, for example, influenced by your predecessors. But you also have uh, Nietzsche there. No, I always said that I was the synthesis of all the writers whom I'd been reading. I'm a sum of all that I've read, be it Marfos, Karsin, Odostoyevsky, Musso, and others. Well, indeed, a number of writers, even writers of Houdinitz, uh, I'm a kind of sponge. I absorb every, everything that I read. For me, to write is to be in an enclosed space where I move with my emotional feelings and I close all my doors outside. So, all the writers that I've been reading have made an influence on me. But I've also quanted uh, Camus because I wanted to remind you of uh, one film from uh, Day to Night, that is what uh, Day owes to the night. And what fascinated me was your description of the conflict, and now we are embarking on politics, that is how you describe the conflicts which are still raging, not only in Algeria, but also those conflicts which you can observe in France. And you say that Albert Camus failed to understand Algeria and what Algeria stands for. And the book that you wrote, which was turned into film, was as a kind of reply to Camus. No, it's not a reply to Camus. Rather, it's an addition. It's another piece of the puzzle. Albert Camus only knew one kind of Algeria. 
It was his fantastic idea of the Algeria that he thought of that was an inspiration for him, but he was distant from reality, yet he had the power to assess everything he saw around him. He saw a cave, he saw a cliff, he suddenly spoke of it as if it had a soul. Yet he was also enclosed and isolated in his manner of thinking. For him, an Algerian was an Arab, whereas we have Kyrgyz, Kabyl, Greeks, and other nationalities there. Of course, the Mediterranean, in certain times, there were a lot of Europeans there, and the people stayed there and became Algerian, and they've been living there for many generations. So you cannot just say that Algerians are just Arabic. Uh, that cannot be pigeonholed in that way. So he stayed in his own enclosed space, and I wrote the day owes to the night to offer a pluralistic view of, to the reader. I never distinguished the good ones and the bad ones in terms of the characters of the uh, book. And someone may undergo transformation, being good and being transformed into bad. What I tried was to add what Albert Camus had written. We also perhaps need to explain your name. Yasmina Khadra is the first two names of your wife. Who isn't here? <laughs> yes, in fact, if you thought I was a woman, I am a man. But I have to say that before my face was on the books, uh, there was a lot of people who were sending love poems to Yasmina. Roses and all that, all that magic is gone now that I've been deveiled. When I read your portrait, I was trying to figure out why is it that you chose that first name? Is it because your wife told you? Could you tell us what is the story? Was it that you gave her your name and she gave you hers? Well, I have to say that Mutanabi had a very hard time with this. I have to say that my wife is not a particularly romantic person. She's a very pragmatic person, and uh, that actually helped me shape myself. So when she told me about uh, giving me my name for eternity, I thought it was a very romantic thing. But let me explain to you why I actually chose to write under uh, an assumed name. Initially, I wrote as Mohammed Mleksul, which is my real name. And I have to say that I was becoming a little bit famous. And the army didn't like that at all. And they said, well, if you're going to publish, then you have to submit your text for censorship. So they called me, and they told me that I need to go to a particular place. Uh, and when I got there, there was nobody there. And I guess the whole lesson of that was to show who's the boss. Anyway, in France, I was given an award. It wasn't a huge award, it was just a regional award, but anyway, I have to say that the hierarchy in the army didn't like that at all. They said, look, there is a, an army person and he's writing and he's getting awards for his writing. So they basically wanted to supervise everything uh, that I wrote. I mean, there was a military censorship committee set, set up for that. In fact, I was supposed to be the only subject that that committee was to study. Um, I didn't want to accept that. I mean, of course, as a military officer, I was engaging in auto-censorship. I didn't say that everything that I wanted to say. If you go back to my old books, 
you will see that I've self-censored myself. But I have to say that the idea of uh, of uh, the censorship committee, I mean, I was far removed geographically, but I was becoming very unhappy with the whole situation. I didn't have children back then, but my wife said that I was supposed to be her source of fun in the Sahara, that there was basically nothing around, that all she had was me and that I was supposed to entertain her. So I was quite unhappy and she told me, look, I'm here in the middle of nowhere, I'm basically exiled. I'm not going to be here with somebody who is unhappy. If you want to write, write. But I said, well, how am I supposed to write with the censorship and all? And she said, just write under an assumed name. And I said, well, a pen name, it's not so easy. We have to sign contracts. And she said, well, I'm going to sign the contracts for you. And then she said, you gave me your name for life, and I'm giving you mine for eternity. And then the whole horizon sort of opened up in front of my eyes, and that's what I did. But in the year 2000, you actually said in an interview for Le Monde that your, your real name is not Yasmin Khadra. By then you left the army, I believe. I don't know actually what happened. Did somebody rat you out, or what happened? No, not, not at all. I always told people that we should not be afraid of dying because we're going to die of our fear. And that's something that I've learned during the war uh, with the fundamentalists in Algeria. I always wanted to leave the army. In 87, I asked for the first time to be released. Sorry, it was 85, perhaps. And they told me, no, it's impossible. You have a luminous future in the army. You're going to become uh, a high officer. And then in 1993, my first books, my first bigger books started coming out. So I wanted to resign again. But then, unfortunately, the Islamist war started, and I couldn't desert. So I continued until 2000. And then I was able to retire as a military officer. So I had a choice between becoming a general or a writer, and I chose to become a writer. So I did not desert the army. There was, in fact, a newspaper article uh, here in a magazine that is written in French that I was an exile. I'm not an exile, I just emigrated. But I work in France. Yeah, I work in France. I uh, lead a cultural center, but I can come back to my country whenever I want. So it's not fair to say that I'm an exile. No, I'm a free man, I can do whatever I want. And I defended my country with arms at some point. Now I just write. And I would uh, never allow anyone to make it impossible for me to go home and be happy. So I'm not an outsider. I'm not an exile. It, I'm simply somebody who has moved to a different country. You're the director of the Algerian Cultural Center in Paris. So I suppose you have the choice of when you want to express yourself and say whatever you want, or does it depend on your hierarchy? I have to say that nobody has ever called me from Algeria, whether to say something good or to say something bad to me. And uh, when I came to Paris, I said to the Algerian TV that I'm not going, that nobody's going to be the boss of me, that there is no authority above me. And why is that? I said, well, I spent 36 years of my life in the army, and all I had to do was obey. And when I left the army, it's so that I wouldn't have to follow anyone's orders. I came to Paris to help the Algerian culture. Paris is the most prestigious capital of culture of the world. Everything is there. So I wanted to give Algeria visibility. And if we want to be visible, we have to put in an effort. So I went to Paris to help my culture that I believe in, that I've always defended. I mean, a lot of people say, well, what about the system? But I'm actually above the system when it comes to that. Nobody is supervising me. Nobody is keeping an eye on me. I'm an honest person. They have, an honest person. They have nothing against me. I've been married for 28 years, and I've never cheated on my wife.
never taken any bribes, never lied. Just trying to give, give you an example of an Algerian. Of, um, you see, uh, sometimes Algerian intellectuals sort of wallow in their misery, but I wanted to do something for my country. I have been translated all over the world. People know me. I want to set an example. For instance, you have uh, doctors that are doing very well at home and they quit their very good existence and they start working for the Red Cross. They go to the patients and treat them and those are the kind of people that are my idols. That's the kind of people that I want to resemble in my life. And that's all there is to it. I feel that I'm a free man, I do what I do, I do what I want, and I do what my conscience dictates. I'm trying to avoid questions of collective memory of war, French-Algerian war, uh, and uh, the black 10 years, I'm sure that you're going to discuss it in other forums, fora here. But Obviously, I have a lot of questions that I did not want to pose this, this evening. Well, obviously, because we don't have so much time. But I also wanted to say that the French Institute of Prague will show a film on Friday with uh, your commissioner, Lob. It's called Morituri. But now I'd like to let Mr. Pavlata read an extract from a book that has come out in Czech and it's called The Swallows of Kabul. So thank you very much, Mr. Kadra, if I can call you that. <laughs> Mrs. Kadra, worse things could happen to me. So I hope that we'll have another chance to see you again. You have a lot of friends in the audience, I'm sure, and uh, I'm sure people will be interested in the past, present, and the future. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Kadra, and welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I wouldn't want to interpret him simultaneously because he speaks really fast. But anyway, Yasmina Kadra, the Swallows of Kabul. Moksen Ram pushes open the door of his house with an uncertain hand. He hasn't eaten anything since this morning, and his ramblings have worn him out. In the shops, in the market, in the square, wherever he ventured, the immense weariness that he drags around like a convict's ball in a chain caught up with him immediately. His only friend and confidant died of dysentery last year, and Mohsen had a hard time finding anyone to take his place. It's difficult for a person to live with his own shadow. Fear has become the most effective form of vigilance. These days, everyone's touchier than ever before. A remark making confidence can easily be misinterpreted, and the Taliban are indisposed to pardon careless tongues. Since people have nothing but misfortunes to share, everyone prefers to nibble at his disappointments in his own corner and thus avoid burdening himself with other people's problems. In Kabul, where pleasure has been ranked among the deadly sins, seeking any sort of solace from anyone not closely connected to you has become an exercise in futility. With lasting solace, could one hope to obtain in a chaotic world, led quite by a series of compoundingly violent wars, deserted by its patron saints, and given over to the executioners and the crows, in a world the most fervent prayers cannot bring it to his senses. In the room, apart from a large group of men doing services as a two ample aging burst ottomans and a worn-eaten lectern, 
that holds the book of the readings, nothing remains. Moxen has sold all his furniture piece by piece to survive the various short shortages. The windows in his dark house are blocked up. Every time a Taliban passed in the street, he would order Moxen to repair the broken panes without delay, along with the rickety shutters, lest the glimpse of a woman's unbidden face offend someone's unsuspecting passerby. Since Moxen couldn't afford these improvements, he covered the windows with canvas screens. He leaves his shoes on the little flight of steps and collapses on one of the ottomans. A woman's voice from behind a curtain at the end of the halls asks, Can I bring you something to eat? I'm not hungry. Perhaps a little water? If it's cold, I won't say no. Tinkling sounds come from the next room. Then the curtain is drawn aside, revealing a woman beautiful as the dawn. She places a small carafe in front of Moksen and sits down on the other ottoman facing him. Moksen smiles. He always smiles when his wife shows herself to him. She's sublime, her freshness never fades. Despite the rigors of her daily life, despite her mourning for the city, which has been turned over to the obsessions and follies of men, not a single wrinkle marks on Iris' face. It's true that her cheeks have lost their former translucence and the sound of her laughter is seldom heard, but her enormous eyes, as brilliant as emeralds, have kept their magic intact. Moxen brings the little carafe to his lips. His wife waits until he finishes drinking, then clears the carafe away. You seem exhausted, she says. I walked a lot today. My feet are on fire. Zanara brushes her husband's toes with her fingertips, then begins gently massaging his feet. Moxen leans back on his elbows, abandoning himself to his wife's delicate touch. I waited for you at lunch, he says. I forgot. You forgot? I don't know what came over me today. I've never had this feeling before, not even when we lost our house. It was as though I'd passed out. Yet, I was still wandering around, groping my way along. I couldn't recognize any of the streets I was on. I walked up and down them, but it seemed that I wasn't able to cross them. It was truly strange. I was in a kind of a fog. I couldn't remember the way to where I was going, and I didn't know where I wanted to go. He must have been in the sun for too long. No, it was sunstroke. Suddenly, he reaches for his wife's hand, compelling her to stop the massage. Bemused by the desperate force of the grip on her wrist, Zanara lifts her bright eyes and looks him in the face. Moxen hesitates a moment, then asks in a tonelant voice, have I changed? Why are you asking me that? I'm asking if you if I've changed. Zanara throws her splendid brow and reflects. I don't understand. What is it that you want me to talk about? About me? What else? Am I still the same man, the one you preferred over all others? Have I kept the same habits, the same ways? Do you think my reactions are normal? Do I treat you with the same affection? It's certainly true that many things around us have changed. Our house was bombed. Our relatives and friends aren't here anymore. Some of them have, been, have even left this world. You've lost your business. My career has been taken away from me. We don't have enough to eat anymore. And we've stopped making plans for the future. But we're together, Mohsen. For us, that's all that has to count. We're together so that we can support each other. It's up to us, to us alone, to keep hope alive. One day, God will remember us. He'll see that the horrors we've subjected to every day haven't diminished our faith, that we haven't failed in our duty, that we deserve his mercy. Moxin releases his wife's wrist and runs his fingers along her cheekbone. It's an affectionate gesture, and she leans into his caress. You're the only son I have left, Zonaira. Without you, my night would be darker than the deepest darkness and colder than the grave. But for the love of God, if you find that I'm changing toward you, if I'm becoming mean or unjust, please tell me. I feel that things are escaping me. I don't think I'm in control of myself anymore. If I'm going crazy, help me to be aware of it. I'm willing to fail everyone else's expectations, but I can't let myself do you any harm, not even inadvertently. Zonara clearly senses the depth of her husband's distress. To prove to him that he's done nothing wrong in her eyes, she rests her cheek against his diffident palm. We're living through some difficult times, my dear. We moan and groan so much, we've lost the idea of tranquility. When there's a lull all of a sudden, it terrifies us, and we grow suspicious of things that pose no threat. Moxin gently withdraws his fingers from under his wife's cheek. His, his eyes mist over. He has to stare at the ceiling and struggle mightily to contain his emotion. His Adam's apple panics inside his skinny throat. So great is his remorse that a trembling begins in his cheekbones and spreads out in waves and all the way to his lips and his chin. I did something unthinkable this morning, he declares. Zonara freezes, alarmed by the trouble he, she sees in his eyes. She tries to take his hand. He holds them up in front of his chest like a man warding off an attack. I can't believe it, he mutters. How did it happen? How could I? 
more and more intrigued, Zonaira sat up straight. Moxen starts panting, his chest rises and falls at a frightening rate. Though the words horrify him, he tells his tale. A prostitute was stoned in the square. I don't know how, but I joined the crowd of degenerates who were clamoring for her blood. It was as though I'd been taken up by a whirlwind. I too wanted to be in a good position to watch the impure beast perish. And when the rain of stones began to overwhelm the demon, I found myself picking up rocks, me too, and pelting her with them. I must have gone mad, Zonara. How could I dare do such a thing? All my life, I thought of myself as a conscientious objector. Some people made threats and other people made promises, but none of them ever persuaded me to pick up a weapon and kill another person. I I agreed to have enemies, but I couldn't bear beating, being the enemy of anyone else, no matter who. And this morning, Zonara, just because the crowd was shouting, I shouted with it. And just because it demanded blood, I called out for blood too. Since then, I can't stop looking at my hands, and I don't recognize them anymore. I walked along the streets, trying to shake off my shadow, trying to put some distance between me and what I've done. And at every corner, at every pile of rubble, I came face to face with that moment of Confusion. I'm afraid of myself, Zonaira. I don't have any more confidence in the man I've become. Zonaira is petrified by her husband's story. Moksen is not the type to bear, to bear his soul. He rarely speaks about his tribulations and almost never lets his emotions show. But a little while ago, when she detected that great pain deep inside his pupils, she knew he couldn't keep it to himself. She was braced for trouble of this kind, though not of this magnitude. Her face pales, and for the first time her eyes, as they grow wider, lose most of her brilliance. You stoned a woman? I even think I hit her on the head. Moxen, come on, you couldn't have done such a thing. That's not your way. You're an educated man. I, I don't know what came over me. It happened so fast. It was as if the crowd put a spell on me. I don't recall gathering up the stones. I only remember that I couldn't get rid of them, and an irresistible rage seemed to come into my arm. What frightens me and saddens me at the same time is that I didn't even try to resist. Zonaira stands up like one who has been knocked flat but then rises again to her feet, weakly, incredulous, but without anger. Her lips, which a moment ago were lush and full, have dried up. She feels around for support, finds only the end of a horizontal beam that juts out from the wall and holds on tight. For a long time she remains still, waiting to regain her senses, but in vain. Moxin tries to take her hand again. She eludes him and straggers, staggers toward the kitchen amid the gentle rustling of her dress. The instant she disappears behind the curtain, Moxin understands that he should not have confided to his wife what he refuses to admit to himself.
طبعا هناك موقف بارز جدا في حياتك وهو عام 2003 في السنه الاولى حيث حيث يتغلب فريق على فريق من الاول ياخدوها ويورونا أبعاد الموقف ده وأبعاد التجربة دي يفكر فيها أبعادها العالمية أبعادها التاريخية أبعادها الفلسفية لو ما فيش يبقى إيه لازمة وهكذا Well, funny enough, the theme of the festival <laughs> is the birth of nations. Uh, so maybe we should start at the birth. <laughs> your birth, your first memories as a child. What were your first memories as a child? Uh, my first memory was when I, I think when I was just uh, uh, so there are not answers, maybe. And uh, my father was coming to the house. You see, my father was married. My mother was his second wife. Yeah. He was married already, and his wife was sick. And my mother was uh, the nurse. Uh, for for his wife, he was about maybe 50, 56, uh, something like this. My mother was 18, 17, and he loved her because he was able to talk with her. She was very intelligent, uh, educated, reads the newspaper and discuss politics with him and such thing. And this. He admired very much, and then he married her and kept another house. So he was moving the, the, the day between two houses. In the morning, he goes to his work. He was a civil servant, and then comes at noon to, man, to our house, and then goes in the afternoon to the first house and spends the night with his uh, sick wife. Yes. He kept this. Uh, so I had the chance to see him at noon, and I remember I was sick also with some problem with my nose and whatever. And he will come holding some uh, uh, fruits in a sack, paper sack, not uh, plastic sack. And then he. He paid in Egypt. <laughs> yes. And then he will come inside and uh, laughing. And that was a very good thing to see him laughing. You mentioned your nose, but you have a profound sense of smell. When did you realize you had a profound sense of smell? You, you do. You, you, could, you can smell things. You can see things. You think that's true? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when did you find out? And how did you find out? I don't know. I cannot. Uh, I cannot. But you have a visceral sense. This question of, of smell will bring this because, of course, there are historical periods, there are visual periods, there are musical periods, but also things smell. There's a peculiar yes. smell yes. touched to childhood, to so many things, yes. to yes. revolutions. They, smell, they don't smell so good. Yes. <laughs> they don't yes. smell so good. So, 
we take this a little bit further, a little bit further, into the sense of why did you wish to be a writer? It must have come at a fairly early age. I think uh, uh, the, the first thing was the problem between my mother and my father. I mean, there was a big problem. She got uh, schizophrenic and uh, started uh, accusing him of trying to kill her. And uh, she was full of energy. I think that it was a kind of uh, a sexual substitute. Uh, she was very alive. And, uh, and she, in the meantime, she was religious. She cannot accept the idea of betraying him. Or, and he was getting old, I mean, uh, starting to be 60 or something, 60 something. And he, not very old, according to modern <laughs> classifications, but somehow older. So, um, and then uh, she went to a hospital, and then she was separated. And uh, after a while, I start to feel, uh, especially when I was in prison. I mean, to to con to contemplate what happened and to, uh, I started to feel uh, pity for her. I mean, that uh, she was, uh, uh, she was a victim somehow to a social situation. Uh, she was from a very poor family. My father was well off and then she maybe she, she she had also a father who was who had a second marriage so she was not uh, happy with uh, her uh, new uh, father with her father's wife and maybe that's what why she uh, accepted to marry an old man and then uh, afterwards what happened and all this she was a victim and uh, I you see, this is an economic victim because you're very involved in looking at the material aspects of the society. She was an economic victim, psychological victim of the society, a traditional victim of the society. You yes, all, all of this, all of this. But this puts you inside yourself. Probably not wanting yes. to take sides. Yes, it pushed of course, you inside. of course. And on the other side, I was... My, the family of my father considered me, uh, oh, this is the son of the nurse. <laughs> so there was this uh, 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 class contradiction yeah. inside, inside the family. And I always, all the time I was feeling very, uh, uh, young stranger to the, to the, fa to, to the family of my father. But you started writing 11 years old when you were quite young, R writing mm, as yes, a diary some, feelings something. to try to find a balance in yes, this world. Yes, of course. This world was a kind of, uh, at the beginning, I have no, I, I didn't want to be a writer of something, but just I wanted to express myself. And uh, it, I felt some moments around me uh, which needed to be uh, dealt with it uh, in, in writing. But you, in a sense, became politically engaged. You were pr in prison in 1959. You were 22 years old. Yeah. When did this political engagement start? Was there any incident which uh, brought you into the sort of path of, uh, of politics? I mean, I was, I mean, all the time since, uh, I mean, this, this, uh, estrangement from the family of my father put me to to think about uh, the class problem and uh, I started reading and the was and I was very uh, romantic I mean I read a lot of things about uh, all the musketeers and saving the the 
young lady from some uh, <laughs> catastrophe. And, and afterwards, uh, uh, th that was the end. That was the end of the forties. I mean, uh, the whole country was full of uh, uh, revolutionary atmosphere. And, and so then, did you read Freud at all? Because you have you, your writing is very, very aware of the sexual tensions, of the psychological manifestations. It was quite extraordinary when. That smell was published in 1966. We'll get to that, but you're aware of these things. It wasn't something that was very commonly uh, pursued in Egyptian literature at the time. In a way, in a way, uh, we had a writer I, 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 called El Mazni. I, I read him in prison. And he was very uh, uh, interested in the uh, erotic aspect of moments in the life of a normal person. And uh, I liked his, his way of writing up, and he was very sensitive and very uh, intelligent. Uh, and then afterwards, in prison, you start, I started to notice the sexual problem of the person. I mean, there was a sexual problem. I mean, people who are in prison for five years or more, and some were t 10 years before when we arrived, there were colleagues who were already in prison since 10 years. And then you, ha you will ask, what, what are they doing? I mean, and it was discussed sometimes, I mean, uh, there were some colleagues who are doctors and they will advise uh, the prisoners, please masturbate very easily. I mean, this is no problem. But can you imagine telling, you know, at, the, at the 50s, telling people to masturbate you know, normally and this is nothing? And even that it was, it is something uh, healthier, and all these things. And then uh, the, the sexual frustration uh, led, uh, uh, you, know, you feel it in the, in the atmosphere, in the way people will look at others, in the movement uh, of the, uh, in their movement, and. Then you start to connect things together. What kind of thing is this? And well, today they solve these problems by torture. <laughs> they just solve all the problems by, by torture. Don't listen to me. Um, you were put in prison. NASA came to power in 1952. The common idea was that NASA was a communist. But in essence, really, the communists in Egypt, they were all imprisoned by NASA. What, what part of the story is, is that? Why did this happen? Look, you were in prison for five look, years. Look, I'll tell you uh, something. Uh, uh, I think maybe you heard about uh, communists, Russian communists, who were tortured and sentenced to this by Stalin. And uh, before they died, they wrote Confessions. on the walls of the yeah. cells, long live Stalin. I mean, they didn't understand well at that time that it is a, the problem of struggle for power is something human and uh, it has nothing to do with uh, beliefs of the people. You can believe anything, but still there is a kind of uh, individuality and uh, some kind of uh, this uh, struggle for power. So uh, in the case of Nasser, of course, he was, he was not a communist in 52. He was just a normal 
officer, very patriotic, very emotional. He has a dream. He was, uh, he believed in the country, and he believed also in his role in the future of this country. So he comes to power and he, he finds, him, uh, finds himself in among uh, different uh, factions and uh, a struggle, a big struggle of power. And then he accepts his role. Huh? And gradually he, he gets uh, powerful and he gets uh, confidence in ruling and he gets the support of the people because of what he has, has already done, starting from kicking the, the British outside, then uh, the the nationalization of uh, Suez Canal, and then uh, being able to defeat or to escape this uh, kind of this aggression, the Israeli, French, English aggression of uh, uh, 56, and afterwards he had a plan. Whatever. Now we may think or we may discuss this, but he had a plan for uh, developing the country, the economy, and he put certain things among his first, his first uh, uh, <coughs> education, free education, free uh, national uh, health insurance, and uh, uh, unemployment, and he was able to solve these things for a while. But he was thinking about the whole area. That then came the problem with other fractions in other Arab countries. That was his mistake. He thought he found his he saw his popularity. So when he went. To, to Damascus in Syria in 58, people were going crazy. They, held, they lifted his uh, car with their hands. Can you imagine? He had so popular, much popularity among all the Arabs. And this, can you imagine if you are such a person and in the morning when you open any newspaper, you found your name in every newspaper in the world, talking about what is the last thing you said yesterday, what is you are going to do about that water. Yeah. You were in prison, you left prison. In 1966, you published That Smell. Yes. A very important uh, text, book. It was banned. Must be translated into Czech. There's a new translation in, in just published in, in English. It's the cotidian in a sense. It's, it's the reality in a very plain way, in a casual way, in a cool way, where everybody could relate to. The book was banned. You went on, and if we skip some time, lots of smells. We have the committee. The committee which was published here it seems to be similar to, to Kafka, but really it's not. Kafka is much more metaphysical. He's attending sort of the, the, the older, the sacred books. But for myself, the committee is very real. It's spot on. There's the bureaucracy. It's still here. Nothing's changed. Or has it changed? Has it changed in Egypt? The question of the, the bureaucracy, the, the ideas that you had for the committee, has, have things changed, or is it the same? When? Now. When, when now? You, yes, just now. Just now. Uh -huh. Because we, we could go on forever about the Arab Spring, many things, and you're here, you can speak. But have things changed profoundly since the committee? You're going to read from the committee. Have they <sighs> changed very much? Yes, they are. There is something very important. Uh, now, now, 
nowadays, people are not afraid to express what they believe and what they want. This is the most important thing which we gained from uh, what happened uh, two years ago. And with the difference between what's happen happening today and before. We never had such a, 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 a free, open atmosphere for exception. Even under Nasser. Nasser was, in a way, he was a dictator somehow. In a way, and you can, we can discuss this, but he didn't like to have any opposition. But you were in prison, there were two sort of wings. First wing, the communists, the other was the, the Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. Now the Brotherhood in power. You, you're fairly amused by that? Hmm? You're amused? Uh, it's surprising. Yes. That now those who are imprisoned have the power. Yes. It's a great change? Um, I, look, if, you, if you, you follow the changes since all the last 50 years, you will see that it is logical that it will go in, in that direction. I mean, you, uh, I mean, the, the, the system which was created by Nasser, Sadat, who is a real anti-Nasser and anti-revolution and a, an agent of the uh, imperialist, uh, an agent, an American agent, in a way. Huh? What, the, what he did, he, it was he who started using the Islamist in the political uh, struggle. Arming them, giving them money and weapons and all this in order to fight the uh, communists and the other leftist uh, groups. So, and, and with this, everything deteriorated until we reached uh, the morning, uh, this moment. Uh, two years ago, there was a revolution, and the people suddenly found that what they were revolting against He was toppled down, okay? But they had no idea what to do afterwards, with whom to, who, who will come. So, and it started, the old regime started planning and manipulating and trying to find its way. And so, uh, it is not, it, it is, it is, normal that people will find some kind of relief. I heard it from many people that, oh, look, these Muslim brothers, they at least know God, at least know God. But now they discovered, these who said so, discovered now that the God which they know is different from the other God. <laughs> So you can uh, uh, feel the change and uh, realize that uh, at the moment they are losing very much of their popularity, which was uh, due to uh, some kind of ignorance of the people had no, info. they didn't understand this, uh, this uh, group. We 
can continue this conversation because Sonara will be here. You can speak to him really directly. It's a very intimate festival. That's why you're here. That's why we're here is to do with personal experience. I wish to invite you to read from the committee. Which name? Your book, the yes, committee. I, I must read. Okay. Good. I will start. Not a bad idea. I start. But but listen. Yes. I I am not a good reader. And I make mistakes in our language, in the pronunciation. I have, I have a problem with pronunciation, so you have to, so you have to accept uh, the result, okay? The festival, is a, the festival is a kind God. Ah, good. I took my briefcase in my right hand, fingered my necktie with the left to be sure that it was straight. Assuming a confident smile, I placed my hand on the white porcelain doorknob, which I had looked at dozens of times in the last three hours. I turned it, pushed, and entered the meeting room. Right off, I erred on two counts. In my confusion, which I vainly tried to hide, I forgot to close the door behind me. Then I heard a female voice nearby say tactfully, please close the door. I turned scarlet and went back to the door. Grasping the knob in my left hand, I pushed, but it wouldn't latch. The door was old and required some pressure to close. I had my briefcase, a briefcase in my right hand, so I pressed with my knee. Sweat trickled down my forehead. After then I heard the same tactful voice say, please put the briefcase down and use both hands. I realized I had lost the first round. I had known the committee would question me. Its goal wasn't limited to probing the breadth of my knowledge, but extended to finding the key to my personality and the caliber of my mental abilities. The content of the answer wasn't everything, although it did carry some weight. Rather, assertiveness was paramount. As I have already said, I spent the past year preparing for this day in all kinds of ways. I devoted myself to studying the language the committee uses in its interviews. I reviewed all I knew about various fields of learning. I reread philosophy, the arts, chemistry, and economics. I set myself hundreds of inconsistent problems. Spending days and nights in search of answers, I followed quiz shows on television and consulted the equivalent section of newspapers and magazines. Luck was on my side when I discovered that my brother, 20 years older than I, still kept a complete set of Believe It or Not. In a package held together with rubber bands, he had kept every issue since its first publication 30 years ago. Not satisfied with this, I tried to form a clear idea of the committee's work by searching out others who had appeared before it. Although I was sure there were many, I could only get in touch with a few, most denied ever having gone before the committee, or even denied all knowledge of its existence. The rest used the excuse that they had forgotten the details, so their reports were vague and contradictory. I got other tidbits of news from various sources, but they didn't help me either. The only thing I came up with was, that there was no set method to the committee's work. When I tried to gather information about the committee members in hopes of getting an idea of their prejudices and predilections, I found a shroud of secrecy veiling their names and jobs. Everyone whom I asked regarded me with anxious and pitifying looks. However, all agreed that the committee sets clever traps for everyone in interviews. This means that the tale of the door that wouldn't shut was not a coincidence. It revealed my confusion and lack of resourcefulness even before the interview began. You can imagine my state after failing this test. I stood before them drenched in sweat. Oddly enough, I sensed way down deep a feeling of satisfaction at this failure as though some part of me feared success. This did not prevent my confusion or my overwhelming desire to gain the approval of those lined up before me at the long table stretching the width of the hall. There were many of them. Unable to concentrate, I couldn't count accurately. Some of them were absorbed in whispered asides and others in leafing through the papers before them. Most wore large, dark glasses to hide their eyes. It seemed to me that among them were familiar faces which had looked out at me at one time or another from the pages of newspapers and magazines. I also discovered that I knew the owner of the tactful voice 
boys, an old maid whom I had met on some occasion. I reproached myself that I had not shown any interest in her at that time. She looked at me with what I thought was a friendly smile. It didn't surprise me to see the military represented among them. On their collars, red ribbons edged with gold indicated their high rank. In the middle of the group was a decrepit old man who wore thick eyeglasses and held a paper so close it almost touched them. He was trying hard to read. I surmised that the paper must be part of a special dossier on me. The old man finished reading, or perhaps gave up trying, and put the paper down on the table. As he turned his head to the left, then the right, his colleagues realized that the session had convened. They fell silent and turned their eyes on me. I stared at the old man's lips. His sallow face seemed as remote from life as it could be. He spoke to me. At the beginning of this meeting, I'd like to put on record my appreciation, which my companions share, of you choosing to appear before us. This does not mean that we will necessarily endorse your point of view. This matter depends on many things, and we are here today to settle it. But what I would like to make clear is that an appearance before the committee, as everyone knows, is not compulsory. In this day and age, everyone enjoys complete freedom of choice. This choice on your part reflects a high degree of sound judgment, and this is an important indicator which we will take into consideration when we review your case. Only first, we would like to hear your point of view in this matter. I was aware of what I had heard from various sources. The committee always requires those it interviews to present the reasons and motives bringing them before it. Therefore, I prepared an answer in advance. I had expected the committee to be, to be on to me, so I thought long and hard before settling on the requisite response. I did not want to present a tried answer something uh, they had heard before, ostensibly meant to flatter. Rather, I wanted to present a unique answer that would appear simple and spontaneous, as though the question had taken me by surprise. My reply would be reliable and true, giving a precise picture of myself without getting entangled in specifics, such as the true motives of some of my actions. I must allude to these activities so as to absolve myself of responsibility for everything prejudicial to me in the case. I must make them infer what I imagine would meet with their approval. In fact, this was an extremely onerous task, given the highly sophisticated surveillance techniques which they used to find out everything about me. Working up my nerve, I took several deep breaths, then began to speak. My voice could scarcely be heard. The old man leaned forward, cupping his hand around his right ear. Excuse me, I don't hear very well with this ear. Can you speak up? I complied with this request and began the answer I had already prepared. Needless to say, I forgot a large part of it as I nervously struggled to speak their language without serious grammatical mistakes. Nevertheless, I managed to sketch a general picture of my background and the way my life evolved under circumstances which allowed me few options. At the same time, I was spurred on by grandiose dreams and the desire to promote my talents and get everything I could out of them. I made sure I mentioned the standards and moral principles by which I was guided. After that, I moved on to the misfortune that it caused my illness. I said that, in all likelihood, my illness was the result of a vast disparity between ambitions and actual abilities, leaving me fed up with everything to the point where I had no option but to change my life completely. I added a well-rehearsed, dramatic flourish to my speech. Opening my briefcase, I took out a sheaf of testimonials which I obtained from various sources, extolling my abilities and confirming the accuracy of the information I had presented. Since most of these documents were in Arabic, I began to speak about them in the committee's language. They listened to me with interest while sorting through the papers I had just given them. I noticed that a fair complected and white-eyed member seated at the old man's left paid no attention to the testimonials. He was absorbed been examining a file, then undoubtedly contained secret reports on me. A short, ugly member, seated on the chairman's right, between him and an officer, looked up and addressed me with hostility. I can't understand you. After all the progress you've made, here you are trying to start over. Don't you think it's a little too late for this? I answered him directly. Indeed, most people start a new life at 40. 
This isn't a new beginning. It's the strength of the world, but rather the culmination of the early stages of life's journey. A complete blossoming to diverse potentials I possess. From any angle, it can be considered a natural evolution of my personality. A stubby snorted angrily. I was taken aback by his rancor. I had a vague feeling that I might have antagonized him by demonstrating my talents and even going so far as to offer proof in the form of those testimonials from respected and influential parties. I continued this train of thought and came to the conclusion that perhaps as a young man he had stood in my shoes. The committee must have given him its stamp of approval, but apparently it failed to live up to his expectations. It would seem that in the end he got no further than being nearly one of its members. Notwithstanding the committee's importance and his extensive influence, some, including me, considered membership evidence of withering talent and spoke. She was seated at the far left, near an obese man, wearing a white jacket, his legs crossed, his head thrown back, gazing at the ceiling as though he were not with us. She asked me, do you know how to dance? Yes, indeed, of course. Stubby butted in, show us that. What sort of dancing? I realized this question was a mistake. What sort of dancing, indeed? As if it, as if it, sorry, as if, it, as if, it, as if it were any other. Sorry about that. Without hesitation, I acted, hoping speed and thinness would testify on my behalf. Finding nothing else, I took my necktie and bound it around my waist just above, just above my hip bones, right where it would emphasize the body's flexibility. I made a point of putting the knot on the side, as professional and belly dancers do. I soon discovered that worn this way, and it's a great feature. It separated the belly from the backside, allowing each independent movement. I began to undulate, lifting my ankles a little off the ground. Glancing down at them over my shoulder, I raised my arms above my head and twined my fingers, framing my face with my arms. I danced energetically for a little while, making an effort to snap my fingers. Even after licking my index, I was so absorbed I didn't notice the impression I made on the members. The chairman, who had not and saw not, spoke suddenly, motioning with his hands. Enough. At that point, one of the officers, his face almost completely hidden large dark glasses, leaned forward and said, We know almost everything about you from the papers before us. However, there is one thing that we still don't know, which is, where were you during that year? Could you please tell us? I managed to stay busy removing my tie from my waist and retying it around my neck while thinking about the year he referred to. From what I knew of the committee's language, the demonstrative pronoun he had used did not refer to the current year. Since he hadn't mentioned a specific year, he must have intended that. Inasmuch as I couldn't imagine the mission in the report about me, this had to be a trap. I couldn't ask for a clarification of the year intended without springing the trap. It was imperative that I figure it out for myself and as quickly as possible. To me, the question was of the utmost difficulty. I decided the one way out was to exclude on the basis of my age at the time. Some of the probable years, such as 1994 and 1952, so narrowing the field of discussion. There remained the years 56, 58, 61, and 67. A concise answer occurred to me before the business set in, one that did not deviate from the truth by much, but still was not comprehensive. In jail, I said. Though short, my answer dumbfounded them. No one asked me anything. Part of the hostile atmosphere confronting me at the beginning cleared, or so I imagined. 
I was at a loss to interpret the look I'd seen in the blonde's light colored eyes. Was it perhaps mocking? I saw him note something with a red pen on the paper before him and lean toward the old chairman to whisper something in his left ear. Then he handed the paper to Stanley. The chairman addressed me sternly. We have heard a long speech from you on your talents and abilities. However, we have reports here saying that you can perform with a certain woman. This report is unquestionable, since it was submitted by the very woman exposed to this inadequacy. What do you have to say about it? This question took me by surprise. I felt confused. This unwanted episode hadn't happened with just one woman, but with several, and for a variety of reasons. Since the committee was painstakingly its work, my answer must be specific. But how could it be when I didn't know which woman they meant? Stubby, motivated by malice, saved me from answering. Unable to control himself, he shouted, maybe he is impotent. But the blonde didn't share that opinion. He leaned over to the chairman's ear and said, he's probably dot, dot, dot. I didn't hear the rest of the sentence, but I had no difficulty guessing. The blonde motioned for me to come over until I stood before him. Then he ordered me to take off my pants. So I did. I laid them over the back of an empty seat, then stood before the committee in my boxer shorts, socks, and shoes. They kept looking at me as though waiting for something. I pointed to my underwear. These two? The blonde nodded. I removed my shorts and put them on top of the trousers. Meanwhile, their eyes settled attentively on my naked parts. Next, the blonde asked me to turn my back. Then he ordered me to bend over. I felt his hand on my naked buttocks. He ordered me to cough. At that moment, I felt a finger inside my body. After he withdrew his finger, I straightened up and faced him again. I saw this blonde man look at the chairman and say triumphantly, Didn't I tell you? The old man smiled for the first time. Everyone burst out talking simultaneously. Commotion filled the hall and I couldn't make out anything they said. Finally, the chairman pounded on the table with his fist to cut off the chatter. When the tumult had subsided completely, he turned to me and said, whether we consider the events based on their number or magnitude, or based on their future ramifications, we undoubtedly live in the greatest country in history, by which momentous event among the wars, revolutions, inventions, will our century be re remembered for in the future? I welcome this question, in spite of its difficulty, because I found it an opportunity to demonstrate my knowledge of subjects especially interesting to me. This question is well worth asking. I can cite many matters of such gravity. The blonde interrupted, explaining, we want only one thing, that it be international and that it embody the notable and timeless concepts of this century's civilization. I smiled. This is the difficulty in a nutshell. Honor. We could mention Marilyn Monroe. This American beauty was truly an international cultural phenomenon, but a fleeting one, which ran its course. Under the influence of the gifted, such as Dior or Cardan, the standards of beauty changed every day. Human beings themselves are transitory, which characteristic leads us to the, the soon to be depleted Arab oil. We might also mention the conquest of space, except that it has yet to bring about anything of value. The same standard makes us eliminate many revolutions, although it may occur to us to cause a Vietnam. However, this is not advisable since it would lead us to the unnecessary ideological complications. I say all this because you requested a motif by which our century would be remembered in the future. However, to serve as a motif, the phenomenon itself must still be found in the future. If we go in another direction, we can find a higher 
the, the right road with no trouble. It is unfortunately a long, crowded road, like the Cairo Airport road, with its billboards displaying in large letters brand names such as Philips, Toshiba, Gillette, Michelin, Shell, Kodak, Westinghouse, Ford, Nestle, and Marlboro. I suspect you agree with me, your honors, that the whole world uses these brand name products, just as the giant corporations producing them in turn use the world, transforming the workers into machines, the consumers into numbers, and countries into markets. Thus, these products are the alarming result of our century's scientific and technological achievements. Furthermore, they will neither perish nor be exhausted, having been created to last. Which do we choose then? I paused, keeping them on tenor hooks, and looked at them. Then I answered dramatically, not one. A muttering arose among the members. I ventured to raise my hand and say, Wait a moment, Your Honours. I didn't mean I'm unable to answer the question this Reverend Committee has posed, but rather I mean to say that the answer is not among the names I gave you. I paused a moment, then continued. In response to your question, Your Honours, I will say just one word, although some would consider it too, Coca-Cola. I'm afraid this is the end of the chapter that we have in English. I apologize that we read a little bit faster than the author. Sorry. I can't understand you. So you are in a long period of time, and you are in this age of new age. Do you think that the time has passed for that? I was told that the people of the world are beginning a new life after the 40s. And it is not a new age of new age in the meaning of the word. وإنما هي تتويج للمسيبة السابقة واستثمار شامل للإمكانيات المختلفة التي أملكها ومن زوايا عديدة يمكن اعتبارها تطورا طبيعا لشخصيتي أم عمل قصير غاضبا وعجبت لحقده علي وأحسست إحساسا مبهما أنني أثرته عند أنبسط مواهبي ودللت عليها بالشهادات الصادرة من جهات محترمة ذات النفوذ وتتبعت هذا الخط من التفكير فقدرت أنه ربما يكون وقف موقفي في صدر شبابه وأجازته اللجنة لكنه فشل في تحقيق الآمال المعقودة عليه وانتهى به الأمر إلى أن يكون مجرد عضو من أعضاها ذلك أنه بالرغم من خطورة اللجنة وضخامة نفوذها فإن البعض منهم وأنا منهم يعتبرون عضويتها دليلا على نضوب الموهبة والفشل التام تكلمت إحدى السيدات وهي عجوز وقور كانت تجلس في أقصى اليسار إلى جواب رجل بدين يرتدي سترة بيضاء ويضع ساقا على ساق رافعا رأسه إلى أعلى محدقا في السقف كأنه ليس معنا سألتني هل تعرف الرقص؟ أجل بالطبع فتدخل الرجل القصير غاضبا الغاضب قائلا ابنا اذا Thank you. شكرا. That's you. So, hello. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for being with us. We'd like to thank Yasmir Kadra, Joseph Brod, Mikhail Popelka, Sonala. We're going to have another event, a break, another event, a conversation on revolution with uh, Sonala Ibrahim, Yasmir Kadra, the very distinguished Portuguese novelist from the Carnation Revolution, Miguel Sosa Tavares, moderated by Thomas Sedlacek. A small intermission, it's a very large sort of production. And then Owen Pomuk. So if you have tickets for the gala evening, we'll see you a little bit later. Bless you.
Okay. 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 Okay.